All right, so tonight we're going to talk about the heart of a gossip, and uh, this isn't uh, a message to throw out accusations in any way, but it's a message to um, keep us alert. You know, the Bible says that the devil roams around as a roaring lion, and he has many different methods to try to get us off track, And, and his main mode of operation is if he can get a hold of our tongue, he's got a really, really um, big advantage over us. And so we have to understand um, that God wants to use our words for his good, for his benefit. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you were going to say something, maybe it might have been negative or mean, none of you, I'm just talking myself maybe. But, but, but then, then you, you know, inside you, you, you felt like a little check in your spirit. Anybody can identify with that? You know, just, this, you know, that's the battle that goes on inside your spirit that, that is, is the temple of the Holy Spirit is telling you that there's a different way, but your mind and, and your emotions and, and your fleshly part of you, the carnal part of you might want to go ahead and just, just say it anyway. You know, I would listen to the still small voice in here. Stop trying to hear, hear God audibly. You might not ever hear him audibly. Maybe you will, but you can hear him in here. The Lord has spoken to me hundreds and hundreds of times in my spirit, and it's just as loud as if somebody's standing next to me. If, if you learn to fellowship with the Lord, you can, I, I hear his voice loud and clear. I, I hear it on, on a regular basis. And, uh, because he will speak. Anyone that, that loves you will try to speak into your life. God's always speaking. It's whether or not we're listening. And so the heart of a gossip. The Jewish uh, rabbis teach that gossip is the worst of all sins. Did you know that? They teach that. Gossip is a character assassination that is repeated time and after time. This is what they teach. Every time gossip is shared, it is the equivalent of murdering that person's reputation over and over and over again. Refuse to participate in gossip. We don't want to um, destroy someone's reputation. Do we? You wouldn't want it happening to you. And it's one of those little things that you can find yourself falling into it real easy. But if you know about it and we bring messages like this, we can be sharp on it and we can make some adjustments. God's always looking to make adjustments on our lives. It's whether or not we're going to listen. He prunes us and shapes us with his word and with teachers. He, he's, he's put pastors and teachers in the church as gifts to, to help um, shape us. That's how he prunes us. The Bible says, who the Lord loves, he chastens. He does it, that word chasten, it sounds terrible. And it, also the word purge, purge and chastens is the same word. It means he makes us clean or, or he, he cleans us out. How does he do that? With the word. As we hear the word, it gets into our spirit and we make adjustments according to what the word of God says. And that's how he prunes us. Why does he prune us? To bear more fruit. To bear more fruit for him. Amen? And so if someone tries to share some gossip with you, just tell them that your ears were not created for that. It might be hard at first, but after a while it gets sort of fun. You don't have to raise your voice and... We don't want to participate in gossip on the listening side either. Remember Stephen when Stephen was stoned in the, in, the, um, in the book of Acts? And it said that there was a young man named Saul who stood there, which would later be Paul, one of the greatest men in the Bible. But Saul was standing there holding the coats of those who were stoning Stephen. I believe if we sit there and listen to gossip... And listen to someone destroy another person's reputation or character. We're basically holding the coat and letting them do that. 
Amen? We need to say, you know what? If you don't have anything positive to say, you'd prefer not to hear it. I would imagine that you would only have to say that once to someone, right? I mean, if I wanted to bring you some gossip, which I, I try not to gossip, and you said, nope, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear that character assassination of that person. You would never have to tell me again. I promise you that, right? Sometimes we think that, that in order to um, confront people, see that word confront and things like that, you think, think that it has to be mean and aggressive. It doesn't have to be that way. It could be soft and, and, and pleasant. You could say it with a smile on your face. You could say, I love you, brother. I love you, sister. But I, I'm just, I just don't want to hear things like that. You have to do that. You have to do that. Because the whole part of being a believer and growing up spiritually, you have to guard your heart. For out of it flows the issues of life. I've, I've seen a lot of people, they, they didn't, their faith, they just did not have faith for anything. And it's because they, they, they violate their heart over and over and over and over again. And then when it comes time to believe God for something, they know the scriptures, they know what the word says, but there, there ain't nothing in there. Because they hurt their heart. You, gotta, you hear a message like this and it moves your heart? Act on it because God's trying to strengthen your heart. He's trying to get you stronger in your faith and, and, and help you build your house. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The Bible tells us that. Blessing and cursing comes from the words that we speak. We'll, we'll, we'll eat of the fruit of our lips, the Bible says. We are a product today of our words yesterday gone by. We have to remember that. Now, the definition of gossip, gossip is idle talk or the word careless. Careless talk or rumor, especially about the personal or private affairs of others. Let me read that again. Gossip is, is idle talk or the word careless talk or rumors especially about the personal or private affairs of others. So if you're at work, if you're at work and someone comes up to you and says, did you hear about so-and-so, what they did last night? Say, I, I don't need to hear about so-and-so. I don't need to hear that. Do you need to hear that? You might want to hear it, but you don't need to hear it. Right? I'm, I'm teaching you tonight how to guard your heart, how to build your heart. I'm teaching you to have, when, 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 uh, when the rubber meets the road and you need to bear down and you need to believe and you need to stand in faith, you'll have something in there to do it with. Amen? The Word of God clearly tells us. And like I said, the Jewish rabbis, they taught that, that um, gossip was the worst of all sins. They, even, they taught that it was even worse than murder. They taught that gossip was an abomination, and out of all of the other seven abominations that they mentioned, they all come from a heart of a gossip. And the reason why they say it's worse than murder is, is they, they say, when you gossip, you're continually murdering someone's reputation over and over and over again. Now, you don't want to murder, that's pretty bad. But it's how they, they, they see it in that, that you can do a lot of damage with your tongue. Amen? And they, they taught that according to the, the Old Testament scriptures. You know who else taught that, that gossip was, was a matter of the heart? And the words that we say is a matter of the heart? Jesus taught that. Let's look at his teaching. Look at uh, Matthew 12. As I was preparing this um, message, I became more determined to, um, this will be New King James too, to watch what comes into my ears. I'm pretty good at what, what I say, but I don't want to participate in gossip by hearing it either, right? I, I want to stay out of that realm.
In Matthew 12, verse 34, Jesus is teaching. He says, brood of vipers, talking to the Pharisees, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth speaks. So if you're going to learn to control the words that you say, you can also use the, the words that you say to gauge or show you what your heart's like. What's in your heart towards a, a person or maybe an organization or towards an individual or whatever. If you just want to just say the negative things and the hard things and the revengeful things, that's showing you what's, what's in your heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That will let you know, okay, these words are really trying to come out. So I need to do something about it. What do you do? You go into prayer. And, and whatever, if you can't say anything good, don't say anything at all. Right? Our mothers taught us that. And, and get, get on it. You've got to redirect your words towards that person, place, or thing, and you redirect your words towards them in prayer. Pray for them instead of talking about them. See, the problem is we want to lift ourselves up. We want to, we want to defend ourselves and lift ourselves up, and we usually do it with our words. But, but it's, a, it's because our pride is hurt. We want, you know, let God lift you up. The Bible says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so when you walk away and you refuse to engage in, in words that are not good words to be speaking, you are humbling yourself. God will get your back. God will lift you up. Right? So Jesus tells us, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You hear you, you, any of you work around somebody that all they do is curse? Yeah. Curse, 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 curse. That's all right. It's, it's, it's what's in their heart. It's in, a, it's in there in an abundance. Well, we should be praise, 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 praise. We should praise God continually. Hey, if they're going to spend all that time cursing, you should give God equal time and spend just as much time praising and they're going to come over to you and say, what are you doing? You're going to say, well, you, gave, you praised your God, now I'm going to praise my God. And you just start praising God right there in the place. The sad thing about it is you'll probably be called down to management for praising God, and they'll get off for cursing. If that's the case, don't, don't, don't do it, <laughs> right? Got to, got to do what the employers want you to do because you're working for them. But if you can... Praise God, because you've got to get God's praise in there too, right? Look at verse 35. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things, or this. You could say this, brings forth good words. Because that's what he's talking about, isn't he? He's talking about the words. So a good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things words. Where do you get the good words from? Where do you get the good treasure from? Spending time in the word, coming to church, praying, listening in the CDs, building your spirit, building your heart, building up your most holy faith and praying and believing God. You're building a good treasure in there. And out of that good treasure will come good words. Even if somebody comes up and says the most terrible thing to you, if you got a good treasure in there, you're going to say, you know what? I, I love you anyway, and I'll pray for you. And it won't be phony either. It'll just be your treasure coming out. The treasure. What kind of treasure do we want to have in there? So verse 35, it says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things or good words. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things or evil words. He's talking about our words. He starts the whole thing off in verse 34. He says, Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
And then he says, let me tell you about a good man's treasure and, a, and an evil man's treasure. And they're going to bring forth the good word or they're going to bring forth the evil word. You can know what's in a person's heart by the words they say. But you know what? Like I said earlier, you can know what's in your heart by the words that you say. If you're getting unkind and you're getting to where you're not glorifying God in what you say, whether it's a person, place, or a thing, you, it's a good indicator. you got to guard your heart. How do you guard your heart? How do you turn those words around? Prayer. Jesus said, pray for those people who despitefully use you and disappoint you and hurt you. Pray for those people. Why? When you pray and you, and you use your words out of your good treasure, God does something supernatural in your heart. But when it comes time to believe God for something big, you'll have it. If you listen to him here, you'll have it when you need, when you need to draw on that faith, you'll have it. If you don't listen to him back here, you don't watch your words, and you say whatever comes to your mind, the Bible says only a fool says what comes to their mind. And you're just out there blurting, blurting things out and, and running amok. You might as well just forget about trying to use any kind of faith. I don't care if you know every scripture in the Bible. There's a lot of people like that. For every situation that you're facing, they can quote you a verse and quote you, quote you good. Some of them, two, three verses. But when it comes time to, to, to believe, they ain't got nothing. Because faith works by love. And you're not loving someone if you're talking about them in, in a way that's not Loving and kind. It's just that simple. Amen? Our whole life will be about building our house. What kind of house are you going to build? Because Jesus said a wise man or a wise woman will build their house on the rock. And he said, this is, this is how you build your house on a rock. Jesus said, when you hear my words and you do my words and you hear my words and you do my words... You're building a house. Come on now. Don't let those little joy killers at work get your mouth running. Your, your mouth don't belong to you. It belongs to God. He purchased you with the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Sometimes Christians talk worse than the people in the world. They do. You can go into some churches, and, and it's like mean in there, mean-spirited. And then you can go into like a, a bar room, and everybody's nice and chummy and pal, pal, pal around with you. And some people say, well, I'll just go to the bar because they're nicer in there. That happens. Not here, because we're nice. Right? The bars are the churches of the world. It's where they go get their fellowship. It's where they go get their music. It's where they, they, they just, it's, it's one of their churches. We don't need the bar. We, we have each other. We have God. But if we don't treat each other right, what are we even doing? Amen? When you look at me, you should see someone that Jesus died for. When you look at me, you should see someone that God has invested a lot of time in. Because he has. When, don't, don't even consider like me and what I've done. Just consider what God has done in me. And what he's trying to accomplish in my life. And, and, and help him and, and, and appreciate what he's, what he's done with me. And if I look at you, I'll appreciate the, you the same way. That, that'll help us love each other, won't it? And so Jesus, look at this list. Look at verse 36. He says, but I say to you that every idle word or careless word, that idle, word idle means careless, word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. Every idle word, every careless word. Now, I believe if you get it under the blood of Jesus Christ, you're good to go. Amen? But our words are important. 
When, when you speak words, they go someplace. They just don't vanish in, in thin air. When you, the first place that your words go is right back into your own heart. You can either tear down your heart with your own words or you can build your own heart up. Because you hear yourself with your inner ear. If you speak love and kindness and speak the, speak the favor of God over people, bless them. Don't curse them. It's feeding your own heart. But then also, your words go into other people's hearts too. And it will affect them. How many of you can remember, let's go back as far as like grade school. How many of you can remember maybe a, a mean or a negative word that somebody in grade school might have said to you and it has stuck with you? Um, it don't, it's not ruin your life, but you can remember it. I, I, I can. can. Yeah, I mean, I can. Words are powerful. Amen. The closer someone gets to you, the closer you are to someone, the more effect your words have. So if you got, you got to speak some good words over your, your spouse, right? And your children. You can make or break your children by the words that you say. Amen. You can build their little self-esteem up high, higher than ever by just encouraging them. And not getting down on them. Turn to um, Isaiah 53 verse 7. I want to show you something interesting about Jesus. Are we making some headway on the words? So this is what a pastor teaches on. Amen. I'm called to teach on the whole counsel of the word of God. And bring all the areas in so you can look at all areas. I can't be so lopsided. I would love to preach on healing every time we come. I would love to preach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit every time we come. I would love to preach on, uh, on how to obtain faith every time we come. But you know what? I'm called to teach you the whole counsel of the Word of God. Because if you don't get this, you don't get this tonight, don't even worry about the other stuff. You ain't going to get it. Just, it, it, won't, it won't work. Knowing the scripture is not a magic formula to get you out of trouble. Like abracadabra, open up door. That's not how the scripture works. The, the, as you humble yourself to the word of God, you receive with meekness the engrafted word that, that comes in and becomes a part of who you are with a with humility. And then that faith must be released with, with, by love. Faith works by love. Can't work faith out of an angry heart. You could have it in there. Remember what we have taught before? The faith could be the Cadillac, the nice, shiny Cadillac. But the love is the gas. If you don't have any gas for that Cadillac, you'll be sitting in your, your, your driveway waving to everybody. And everybody will drive by and say, woo, that's a sharp-looking car. And they don't know you can't go nowhere because you ain't got no gas. And it's a convertible, too. And you could be riding down the road with the wind blowing through your hair. Not me so much, but maybe some of you. And you could be just like, woo, but you got to have the gas. Right? It says in 1 Corinthians 13, if I have faith to move mountains and don't have love, I have nothing. Nothing. And the very first step of love is watching the words that you say. If you're saying unloving, unkind, I don't, unkind words, it's not going to work. I don't care how justified you are in your own mind. If it violates the word of God, I'd go with the word. But let's don't get in a ditch here. There's sometimes where you need to articulate and you need to express yourself and you need to, if it's at work and you need to um, um, just, if you're, especially if you're a leader or something or at the home or, I'm not talking about like never saying anything. All I'm saying is, is don't guard your heart, make sure you're not talking out of the flesh though, right? Look at um, Isaiah 53, seven. This is New Living Translation. Talking about Jesus. It says he was oppressed and treated harshly. Yet he never said 
A word. Uh oh. Isaiah 53 7. Who, who are we supposed to be modeling our lives after? Joe Osteen? He's a good preacher. Right? Kenneth Copeland? Andrew Womack? Joyce Myers? We're to be modeling our life after Jesus. If he did it, we can do it. Because he's given us his faith and he's given us his love. Because the Bible says that the love of God has been shed abroad in your hearts. And he's given us his spirit. Our teacher, our counselor, our intercessor, the Holy Spirit within our spirit. We can do what Jesus did. We can walk that walk. He's at the right hand of the Father, is he not? Is he, if he, he's here in bodily form, we're his body. We're his feet. We're his hands. And we're his mouth. Some people, I don't know how, how you guys are, some people are real quick. You don't ever want to get in a mouth battle because they'll chew you up and spit you out fast. Me, I'm a little slow. I think of something two days later that I could have had a good comeback and I didn't have it. The old me. <laughs> oh, I should have said that. I'm like two days slow. When it, I'm on those things. But there's some people, you get in a mouth battle with them, they're quick. They'll chew you up. And I had a cousin like that one time. I never seen him lose a war of words. But you know what? I don't want to get in those kind of battles. <laughs> I want to live the love, win the love battle. I want to win that. But look what Jesus did again. He was oppressed and treated, how? Harshly. Yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. You know why he didn't open his mouth when he was led to the cross? Because he was led there and he was going to die there because of your sins. Amen. He covered you with silence. See, that's what love does. Love covers with silence. You have a bad day, and I'm just throwing stuff out as the Holy Spirit gives us. I'm not talking to anybody specifically, so if this hits you, you can thank the Holy Spirit. Don't get mad at me. Let's throw that little disclaimer in there. You could have a bad day with your spouse, a bad morning or a bad time, and then, then you leave and you go to work, and you're in a bad move, mood, and, and, and someone at work says, are you okay? What's, what's, what's wrong? First of all, do you think they really care about you? But anyway, and you just like, well, it's my spouse. So I'm not even saying husband or wife. I'm just keeping it neutral. Well, it's my spouse. They didn't fill up the dishwasher right. I can't, I'm going to stop because I can't think of stuff. <laughs> They're messy. They throw all their clothes around. They never take me out anywhere. You're cursing your spouse to someone who probably doesn't care anyway. You know what you need to say? I'm good. Sorry if I seemed a little irritable. I'm good. Come on now. That's what you got to do. If you do it back here, you're going to be able to believe God up there. If you don't do it back here, I really, really want every one of you to have, have, have the house built. But there's nothing that could ever take you down. You or your family. There's no devil that will want anything to do with you. Because you got your heart settled on the love of God. Amen? And so don't turn there for time's sake. But you can put it in your notes if you want to look at it a little bit later. And I, Revelations 12, verse um, 10, the Amplified Bible says that 
He says, for our accuser, Satan, he's the accuser of our believing brothers and sisters. He has been thrown down at last. He who accuses them and keeps bringing charges of sinful behavior against them before our God day and night. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. You can read it later in the Amplified Bible, Re Revelation 12, 10. He accuses us before God day and night. And he accuses us of sinful behavior. Jesus covers us. Satan accuses us. Jesus needs vessels to work through. Satan needs vessels to work through. Whose vessel will you be? Because the Bible says, and you can write this in your notes, 2 Timothy 2, 26, the Bible says that there are people that Satan can take captive at his will. And he can get them to say or do anything he wants. Think about the harsh words that have been said to you over your life. Has Satan delivered that word to you directly? I mean, did he show up with a horns and a pitchfork and smoke coming out of his nose? and saying these mean, cruel, hateful things to you? Or did he have them delivered through a human being? That's how he delivers it. I don't want to be a messenger for Satan. He is the accuser of the brethren. That's what he does. Don't let him use you. Let God have control of your words. It's just that real. Someone once said Satan goes to church too. Uh-oh. I don't know. He probably does. Amen? But if you have more people serving God and loving God, then he, you can squash him out. If someone brings him in, they'll get delivered. Right? Think about it. God, how, how's Jesus going to get a good word to somebody? He's going to use you. He's going to put it in your heart. And he's just going to put it in you and you're going to feel love for someone or just feel respect for someone or just honor for someone. And it's going to be in there. You've got to honor that when you feel that, when that's in there. You've got to deliver that message. Don't not speak into someone's life if it's something, especially in the, in the, in the church. I mean, if the Lord gives you a good, ushy-gushy word for me, tell me. I'd like to hear it. Or your brother or your sister. He's using you to deliver. Now, if the devil gives you a word, don't bring it. <laughs> Just say, get behind me, Satan. Amen? So the bottom line is that family gossip hurts. Sometimes people gossip in their family. It's hurtful, isn't it? Church gossip hurts. It hurts me. Well, a lot of times when people don't realize when they want to say things that most of the people in here are more loyal to me than they are to you. And it just comes back to me anyway. And you said it in secret and you said it in private, but, but it comes back to me anyway. And those things are hurtful. Amen? The Bible says if you've got an issue with someone, go ahead and tell them. Right? Go ahead and just tell them. So family gossip hurts. Church gossip hurts. Workplace gossip hurts. All gossip hurts. Doesn't it? I want to tell you how serious the Lord is about gossip. Um, Brother Hagen tells a story. Now, Brother Hagen... It's called the father of the modern faith movement. If you don't know about Brother Hagen, you can, you can get on rhema.org. Don't Google him. Because there's a lot of people out there that don't understand faith, and they'll say all kinds of terrible things about him. But that man was a great man of God. And the reason they say terrible things about him is because he believed, he believed in healing. He believed that you could pray in tongues. He believed that you had the authority in the name of Jesus. Well, I believe that too. Because the Bible tells us. But you go to Rama's website and you can learn, you can get his teachings and you can learn about him. But um, 
A long time ago, when Brother Hagen was first starting out in ministry, he was at a convention with a lot of other pastors and ministers and in his hometown. It might be something like here if the pastors are getting together for a breakfast downtown tomorrow, and, there, and if I go, there might be 20, 25 pastors. It was something like that. And here, one, past, one of the pastors in the, in the uh, community got into some sin. He didn't say what it was, got into some trouble. And um, all the other pastors, guess what they were talking about? That pastor. Just, just talking about what happened, what they heard. I'm not interested in hearing what someone heard. Amen? If you bring me something, bring it in a good heart because you're trying to help someone, then I'll listen. And uh, they asked Brother Hagen what he thought about the situation because he doesn't get into that stuff much, never much. But he did a little bit back then because he said, uh, they asked him what he thought about that minister, and he said, well, you think a fellow would know better? That's all he said. That night in his hotel room, the Lord visited him, and the Lord wasn't happy with him. And the Lord said to him, who are you to judge another man's servant? That's what he said. See, Brother Hagen was healed of three incurable heart diseases. He was healed and he was under a covenant with God. When he went outside of that, that he, his heart started to hurt again. He started to feel like he had heart issues again is what happened to him. And he's praying and wondering, what's God, what's happening to me? And the Lord showed up in his hotel room. And he said, he said this, he said, what did you say about that man? that they were talking about today. And, and Brother Hagin said, all I said was, you think a man ought to know better? The Lord didn't think that was a little statement. And the first thing he said to him was, who are you to judge another man's servant? And then he said, how do you know that you would have done better if you were in that man's shoes? I want to tell you something about Brother Hagin. Through the good part of his ministry, he's, he had a lot of visions. Visions, and the Lord would appear to him. But then the Lord came to him and he said, I'm not going to appear to you anymore in visions and, and, and reveal myself to you anymore. He said, I'm going to reveal myself to you like I do everyone else. He says, because if I keep doing it like this to you, it's going to end up hurting your faith. Ultimately, we are to connect with the Lord in here. But he did it for a while because he was chosen to, to, he was the forefront of the modern faith movement. And uh, just like the Apostle Paul, has some special privileges. Amen? But the Lord did tell him, I'm not going to show up. And he never did show up like that again. But he still had, he still spoke to him in here. Right? But I never forgot that when he told that story. I was there in person when he told it. And you know what I used to think about when Brother Hagin was teaching? I was in the last class that Brother Hagin taught in person. He died, went home to be with the Lord two years after I graduated. And uh, for those two years, they, they just played him on uh, video. But I was in his class. And I remember thinking, I was looking around at the people one day, and I was thinking, did they hear what this man's saying? You know, they were getting maybe the word part down. You know, by his stripes I am healed. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. And they're all good word. But are they hearing? Are they hearing what he's saying? Are they hearing the, the commitment that he made? Are they hearing the sacrifice that he made? Are they hearing the love that he had for the Father? I heard it loud and clear. Brother Hagin once said that only 5% of the people that go to Ramah actually get it. Because they miss, they get, miss it. If you don't have a heart, if your heart ain't right, you're not going to, it's not, it's not worth anything. And the biggest judge of where your heart is, is your words. And this isn't a condemnation message. This is a message to help you. You can walk out here and say, no more. I'm going to watch my words. Don't even listen to it. This is what the Lord put in my heart to tell you tonight. When I was in the military, you got a minute? Just kidding, you got more than a minute. When I was in the military, um, we were on this bus, 
in the, in the army. We were going someplace, I forget. You know, it was one of those things, hurry up and wait. They run you around ragged, and then you, then you get on the bus and you wait for like an hour. Hurry up and wait. I don't know if the other services are like that, but the army, hurry up and wait. Well, anyway, we're, we're sitting on the bus, and there was a, a female captain who said, she said, well, while we're waiting, I got a joke to tell everybody. And she said, but it's a little bit racy or a little bit something. I forget the word she used. So if I, if I think it might have, what's that? Uh, maybe, I don't know. But so if, it, you know, if it offends anybody, if you don't like those types of jokes, you can, you can get off the bus. One guy got off the bus, and it wasn't me. I wish it was me. I didn't want to hear that joke, but I was too embarrassed to get off the bus. I was too embarrassed to stand out and stand up for God. I wish, you don't know how bad I wish I'd have got off that bus that day. I wish, it hurts me to this day. I can't do anything about it now, but I can get off the bus today. And that's what I'll do. You know, you don't get those moments back. I could have glorified God. And I could have said, no, I didn't want to hear some dumb joke. It wasn't even funny anyway. I should, have, I should have glorified God, right? So I'm not only talking about the words that you speak. I'm talking about the words that you hear. I want to tell you something else too. Only on very, very special occasions should you listen to other people's problems especially if they're talking about their husband or wife. You better be sure God has you in that spot to help them. If not, I wouldn't listen to all that stuff. I wouldn't listen to it. Amen? Unless you feel you can bring some, some good word in there and they trust you and, they can, and you can counter their stuff with some good stuff. I wouldn't, I wouldn't listen. Right? Look at... Um, 2 Corinthians 12, 20. I'm inspiring myself tonight. I don't know how you guys are. Seriously. I'm, I'm ready to go to another level with the words I speak and the words I hear. Why? It all affects my heart. Not my flesh pumping heart my inner man, my spirit being that houses the Holy Spirit. Amen? The, Peter calls it the hidden man of the heart. 2 Corinthians 12, 20. Paul says, this is New Living Translation, he says, For I am afraid that when I come, I won't like what I find, and you won't like my response. I am afraid that I will find quarreling, jealousy, anger, selfishness, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorderly behavior. The word, that word in the King James Version is the word whisperings. If you have a King James Version, you're going to see it says whisperings. The reason they whisper is because they know that this kind of talk is wrong. They would get in trouble for what they are saying, whispering. You know, psh, 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 psh. Right? So they whisper in secret. What you utter in secret will be revealed in the open. But they know if they say it in the public, they'll get rebuked. So they whisper. That's another word for gossip. Look at Ephesians 4, verse 29. Remember now, this isn't directed at any individual in here tonight. This is, this is a message for all of us. We need to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying and try to get better. Sometimes people come in and they, they'll... If, if they're with their husband or wife, sometimes they'll nudge him and say, would you tell him about me? I know nothing. It's the Holy Spirit. 
I love being in services where the Holy Spirit ministers to me. I love it. I love it. The Bible says only a fool despises correction and words of, uh, uh, of like these. Right? Look at Ephesians 4.29. Let no, this is King James, I believe, let no corrupt communications proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Now, all these scriptures I'm reading you, they're written to the church. I should have said that earlier. These are written to church people like us. The New Testament is written to the spirit-filled church. And so this tells us that, that as we're in a church, we need to be taught how to speak. Don't we? Because he says, let no corrupt communication. Some translation says words. No corrupt words come out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. I love that. We are all ministers of God's grace, God's favor, God's love, God, God's provision. We are ministers to each other of God's grace. How do we minister? With our words. With our words. So when the Lord puts a word in you, like I said, or something good and something kind and something beneficial, go ahead and tell the person. Minister. Minister that grace to them. Because they don't need to hear it. Don't think that you're not worthy enough. You are worthy enough to bring a word to someone. Amen. Amen. A long time ago, before I came to pa- became a pastor, I didn't say, I was a man of few words. He said that the women have a big vocabulary of words that they say during the day, and then men's box is a little bit smaller. Did you ever hear that? My box was really small. I had just a few amount of words, and I was done. One very sociable, nice person, would never hurt anybody, nice person, liked people, I just wasn't just wasn't very talkative, just, okay, shy. Sometimes shy people come off as if they're mean. Anybody ever have that happen? You're just shy and quiet, people think you're mean, or, or they say, what's the word, like, arrogant, or stuck up, or something. I wasn't any of those things. I just didn't have a lot of confidence. And I was sitting in my dad's church, my dad's church, sitting back there about two seats behind, maybe three seats, maybe two Two seats in front of uh, Sister Lori there, right on the aisle, just sitting there. And uh, I'm thinking, I don't think anybody in here likes me. I don't think anybody really even, no, they didn't have no problem with me, but people like I used to be, I'm not like that now, but people like I used to be are hard to get to know. Because they try, but if you only say a couple words and you don't act like you want to engage them, they're probably not going to come back around again for a while. And, and they just don't, not, they don't, but I was thinking, I don't think anybody likes me. I don't think, uh, I don't know, just, I just was rehearsing that in my mind. And then Dave Best, who was sitting back there where Coop's sitting right now, got out of his seat. He didn't know anything that I was thinking. Came right over to me and he said, the Lord told me to tell you that, that no, he didn't say that, but he said this. I, I know I took it from the Lord. He said, he said, I'm glad you're here tonight. I'm really glad you're here. And when he said that, all that, he ministered grace to me with his words. All that stuff left me. So when we come to church, we we should be sensitive about the people around us. And, And just go ahead and don't be afraid of rejection. Minister. Minister that God's grace to them. Look at verse 30. It says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you were sealed unto the day of redemption. So this corrupt communication, the word corrupt uh, um, is the Greek word phallos. And it it describes something as foul smelling, decaying, rotting, such as meat, a meat full of maggots. That's the actual definition. So sorry if that ruins anybody's supper. But corrupt communication foul, rotting, meat-like smell it gives off. 
That's, what, that's how God sees it. You know, the Bible says our lives should be a, a sweet, smelling fragrance to God. And if we have these corrupt communications, these corrupt words, it's foul. And it grieves the Holy Spirit. It grieves him. This kind of grief can only be experienced by someone who, who loves you very much. Let me, let me tell you a difference here. If I'm down the street, going, if I'm downtown and I don't know the person and they don't like the way I drive, and he pulls up and says, you bozo, get a driver's license. Well, it's going to grieve me a little bit, but I don't know the guy. Right? It's not going to, like, get me. I'm not going to cry about it. Might want to chase him down, but then the Holy Spirit will get a hold of me. Right? <laughs> but if my brother Randy would say something like that to me, it would grieve me. Because he's my brother. And we're close. See the difference? This is the kind of grief that it's talking about. Between two close individuals. When we let those corrupt communications come out, primarily in the church, is what he's talking about, right? In the church, but also in your family or in your workplace. It, it grieves the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he lives inside of you. The Holy Spirit came with his sanctifying power and all of his goodness. He came to sanctify you and separate you unto God. The Holy Spirit came with his ability to edify other people through us. Instead, we choose to gossip or use other words. The Holy Spirit's in you to use you. To use you to edify, to build people up. Amen? Some time ago, there was a man in the church that, um, I don't know what happened to him. Uh, this is maybe five, seven years ago. He just was, everything was fine. Then he, then he had a problem with the church. And um, it wasn't people in the church. It just was the church. The, just, I guess we weren't doing anything for him anymore. We weren't able to minister to him. And, and uh, um, I don't know if it was my teaching or preach. I don't know what it was. But he was disgruntled with the church. And that's okay. I mean, that, that happens. But then I started hearing from like four or five other people that he was voicing that to them, what he felt was wrong with the church and what was going on there and how, how, well, how it bothered him. And, and I didn't like it. Didn't like it at all because you can't affect someone's ability to receive. You shouldn't do that. The Bible says you offend one of those little ones, you might as well tie a millstone around your neck and go ahead and jump in the lake. And besides, I'm serious about these people. I could take it personally. If I don't measure up, fine. Don't start talking to the people in the church about it. And I was upset. And so I called him. But I was calm. Because I, I've learned to be that way. If you talk to someone out of the flesh, you've messed it up. So until you can get yourself calmed down, don't talk to them. But how do you get yourself calmed down? How do you start showing some love and, and, and some compassion towards people? Anybody know? Prayer. Pray for them. We throw that word out all the time. Prayer, pray, I'll pray for you. But do you really do it? Prayer works. Prayer changes you. It changes you. We're worried about prayer changing other people. No, prayer changes you. Where does it change you? In your heart. Because you're doing exactly what Jesus said to do. He said, pray for those people. Why would Jesus tell you to pray for those people if, if it wasn't going to help you? And was, it wasn't going to work. It changes you. And it changed me. And I called the guy. And I was talking to him. And I'm fine with, you know, I, I said, you know, I start talking 
to him and I said, you know, there's other churches you can go to. There's other places you can go to. You go ahead and try to find one. And, uh, but the Holy Spirit spoke up into my spirit. And here's what he told me to tell him. The Lord said, tell him to let the people form their own opinions about the church. It's pretty simple, isn't it? But that's what the Lord said. Let the people form their own opinions. Don't you shape their opinion of the holy place called the church. Because if it's a place of five people or a place of 500, if it's ordained and called by God and the Spirit of God is there and he put those people together, that's holy ground and you dare not touch it. Don't touch it. Amen? So this guy ends up leaving for a while. Then guess what happened? Came home. Came back. What's that saying? If you love someone, set them free. If they come back, they were yours. If they don't, they weren't. I, I know that wasn't how it exactly goes, but that's the gist of it, right? Amen? So here's the golden rule that I've instituted in the church. If the person you're talking to doesn't have anything to do with the problem or the solution to the problem, don't speak to them about the problem. Amen? So if sister so-and-so over here, not over here, not you, I'm just, I'm just used to, <laughs> steps on your brand new Sunday dress and rips it, I'm sure it was an accident. Don't go over to the sister over here and say, do you know what sister did last Sunday? Stepped on my dress and ripped it. I think she ought to pay for it. She didn't offer to pay for it. Don't you think she ought to pay for it? Did they have anything to do with the problem? Did they have anything to do with the solution to the problem? Then why are you talking to them about it? Right? Remember what the whole bottom line is. It's going to be your heart that's affected the most. And your heart's affected by your, what you say and what you don't say. What you hear and what you don't hear. That's how powerful words are, isn't it? There was a uh, minister that I went to a seminar one time. He was a really good minister. And uh, he said that um, th it was a bigger church. It was right out sub the suburbs of Philadelphia. So millions and millions of people. So, I mean, probably a church of like 5,000 people. Really booming and, and growing. And um, he said that they had um, cell groups or home study groups in the church. I'm not a big fan of those because you really, really got to keep track of who's running those programs because they can pull off and be, it's us for no more. And sometimes human nature likes to, likes to wed people to themselves. So I'll never do that unless the Lord specifically tells me to do that. But he had them because he needed them because you got a church of 5,000 people. You got to make them closer. You got to do stuff like that. You do. You just got to pick your leaders wisely. Well, there was a woman in, the, in one of the home groups that got really, really offended bad. And he didn't say what it was, but it must have been terrible. And she had a legitimate point. And he went and talked to her. He talked to the home study group leaders and, and sat them down and, and corrected everything with, with them. And then he has a meeting again with this lady that got offended. And he said, look, he said, you got two choices. You can leave the church. And I wouldn't blame you if you did. I don't know what happened, but it must have been bad. He said, I wouldn't blame you if you did leave the church. Or you can choose to forgive that person and stay. We'd love to have you. The choice that you don't have is to stay in the church offended. You don't have that choice. You can't stay here offended. Makes sense to me, right? Why? It's counter to what the Holy Spirit's trying to do. Because when people are offended in the church with their words, they like to tell other people about their offense. And then people in the church are kind and loving and, and care, and they care about what's right and what's wrong, but then they, they start to take up other people's offenses. 
And then the next thing you know, I'm preaching and I'm looking at the Hatfields and I'm looking at the McCoys. And I'm trying to say, Holy Spirit, let's, there ain't nothing happening. Not in here, but that's what happens. So the best thing for that woman to do, if she wasn't willing to forgive, was to just let, just, just, just to, um, to go, find another church. But she didn't have the option to stay there offended. The same minister said that um, there was a woman that came up to him one time, another woman, I'm not picking on women, but it happened to be women. <laughs> she came up to him and she said, why is it that everyone in the church brings me all their problems with the church? They, they all come to me. And he said, I'll tell you why. He says, because you're their trash can and they like to dump their garbage into you. That's what he said. I don't talk to people like that but he did made sense though if you're going to listen and, and you're going to like that attention and you're going to keep taking all this stuff in you can be the Ann Landers of the church if you want you know who Ann Landers is advice column anyway I'm going way back maybe but you know what you're going to have an ineffective heart to believe with and we need to believe God don't we we need to reach deep down inside and believe what the word says and, and fellowship with the Holy Spirit and, and get into his presence and then come out of his presence speaking the word of life amen and we can't get there if we don't watch the words that we say and so I hope this helps you. It helped me. I really preached it myself tonight. And um, like I said, for me, it's not so much the words I say, but sometimes it's the words that I, I let be said. Because I don't like to hurt anybody's feelings. I was visiting a, an older guy one time. He was just about ready to go home to be with the Lord. And he was sitting in his, I was sitting in his living room and I was just trying to minister to him. And he was telling me about his old church that he went to for years, way back when. And he just wanted to talk about his pastor and his pastor's children. And he's telling me how, how his, however, all of his, how all of his old pastor's children are, and none of them go to church. And this one does this, and this one does that, and they're doing these terrible things. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how can I minister to that? But you know what? It's just like the getting off the bus story. I let him talk. I like to think that I've grown as a minister, grown as a person. If I'm in that position again, I'm going to say, look, look, hey, 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 I don't need to hear about your old pastor. I love your brother. I'll, I'll minister you to the words, but he's really none of my business, and I'm sure he did the best he could do. And Jesus really does say, who are we to judge another man's servant? But all those years he spent in that church, and that's all the more he loved his pastor. You can tell where your heart's at by what the words come out. You should love every part about your pastor, his wife, his children, everything about me, and I should love everything about you, and you should love everything about each other because you pray about everything. Right? Or else we're just basically being religious but we're not a religious place are we we're spirit filled children of God that's all I have would you rise please so I appreciate you listening tonight and like I said we all need messages like that we, we need them amen some of my most life changing experiences were messages like this where God spoke right into my heart. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for this message that you've given me. I thank you, Lord, that, that I believe that each and every one of us will make a commitment, Lord, to put a watch over our mouth, Lord God. Father, may the Holy Spirit just um, prompt us when we're not to say something or when we're to not to hear something, Lord. May we all get better at it, Father. And may we pray for those people that, 
make us angry and there's people that hurt us or disappoint us. For Lord, when we pray for them, you will change our hearts. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.